For those that are visiting with us, let me now turn our attention uh, to God's Word. Those that are visiting with us, we are concluding a series that we titled Flourishing in Your Desert. Uh, Flourishing in Your Desert. Uh, so just to give us a picture of where we've come from, we took, we're looking at the character of Isaac uh, from the book of Genesis. And uh, we took three images from the book of Genesis, from the life of Isaac that depicts something that we would like to learn from the life of Isaac this month. The first one, we took the image of wood and we learned what a life of priorities looks like. The second image was last Sunday, we took the image of the journey that Isaac took to be able to get a wife and we talked about the value of a life of process. Today, I'd like to take the image in chapter 26 of Genesis, the image of wells, and we'll be talking about a life of produce, all right? A life of produce. That's what we'll be talking about today as we conclude the series. Can I hear you say flourishing in your desert? That's what we're talking about. Now, many of us know that water is one of the basic human needs, probably the most basic human needs. Many people say if you go without water for anywhere around three days, you're most probably going to die. Uh, so water is such an important commodity for our existence. Now, it's very interesting because places where water is available usually develop into settlements. They usually develop into places where people gather and want to live. It's almost like people live around water. In fact, many of these settlements later on even become cities. An example is the most and the greatest and the most amazing city in Africa. And which city is that? Thank you for saying Nairobi with confidence. Let me try that again. An example is the most amazing, the most amazing city in Africa. Is which city? Nairobi. It's from the Maasai phrase. The word Nairobi is from the Maasai phrase, Enkare Nyrobi. The place, now the Maasai is here. No, I have crucified the name, but it's okay. It's okay. It means the place of cool waters. And it later on became a settlement, now a city. Again, the point is people gravitate towards those places where this very special and critical commodity is found. Now, in the passage that we're going to look at, we're going to look at a passage that has a lot of wells, uh, specifically wells that were dug by Abraham and wells that were dug by Isaac throughout the arid section of the Negev region. It's the southern part of the land of Canaan. It was so critical because these wells resulted in people gathering around these sources of water because people depend on water to survive. Water is life. And wells are a vital source of water for people and of livestock. And that's what today's story basically revolves around. So we're in Genesis chapter 26. Again, like last Sunday, it's a very long chapter. We can't read the whole of the chapter, but let me just give us a, give us a snapshot of what is happening in this chapter, and then I'll zero in to the respective sections of the chapter where we're going to be learning uh, from uh, what a life of produce uh, looks like. Now, many of you remember last Sunday we looked at Isaac and how he met Rebecca. He was 40 years old when he finally married Rebecca. But in chapter 26, where we are right now, there is a famine. A famine has happened in the land where Isaac and Rebekah live, and unfortunately, Isaac and Rebekah are forced, because of this famine, to leave their home, and interestingly, they went to the same place where Isaac's parents, Abraham and Sarah, had fled to, or had gone to, after Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. They settled in a town called Gerar, and this is where we see Isaac and Rebekah also fleeing to, this town called Gerar. It's a leading city in the land of Philistia, where the Philistines were. And Isaac, when he finally takes his family, he takes Rebekah, and they go and settle in Gerar, he finds that the Philistines that were living there had actually filled the wells 
that his father Abraham had dug. They had plugged them in and already sealed all those wells that Abraham had dug. Abraham had made a, an oath or a covenant with a king called Abimelech. And that allowed him to settle in the land and to build these wells and to continue living there. But after the Philistines discovered that Abraham had died, they broke the oath that they had made with Abraham, and they plugged in all the wells, and they filled all the wells. Isaac now comes back to this land where his father was, and he's surprised because all these wells have been filled up. Now, interestingly, Isaac did not complain. Isaac did not even give up on the wells that had already been filled in. Instead, we see Isaac picking his shovel, and Isaac starts redigging those wells, and clearing those wells. Before long, these wells that had been filled up started supplying water again. Isaac does not stop there. He does not stop with redigging the wells that had been filled up. He even digs new wells in that land. This land that was now dry, this land that was unable to sustain life when Isaac came once again is a land that is flowing with water and life because of the wells he has redug and the new wells that he has actually dug. And Isaac starts farming. He starts keeping livestock, flocks and herds. And the Bible says the Lord blesses him and he became extremely wealthy. In fact, verse 14 of chapter uh, 26 of Genesis said, he had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. The Philistines, the very inhabitants of that land, had never seen such wealth and such prosperity. It's this foreigner that has come and has become so industrious and has become so wealthy. The Philistines become envious about Isaac's prosperity. And it results in so many conflicts and even economic sabotage against Isaac. The Philistines continued what they had done to Abraham's wells before. They now come and plug these very wells that Isaac is redigging. They plug up these wells and seal these wells. And the Philistines begin to fight against, over these wells, against Isaac. And Isaac's people and family and the Philistines start quarreling with each other. The conflict escalates and finally Isaac is kicked out. Of the country. Water was as valuable then as oil is valuable to us today. And we see this happening in this passage. The point we're making in today's sermon is God's blessings do not come easy. God's blessings also does not mean that everything will be easy. Blessings sometimes come with suffering. Blessings sometimes come with suffering. Remember, we're talking about flourishing in your desert. The big question I'd like to ask us today as we conclude this series, what should you watch out for when you are in your desert? What are the things that you should be careful about when you're going through your desert experience so that you can be able to flourish in your own desert? And from the passage that we're looking at today in Genesis chapter 26, there are three things that I'd like us to briefly look at. Number one, comparison. Be careful. Watch out for comparison. Number two, contempt. And number three, conflict. Comparison, contempt, and conflict. You'll see the sections that we're covering. Comparison is from chapter one, uh, sorry, from verse one to verse 13 of chapter 26. Comparison, number one. Now there was a famine in the land. Besides the previous famine, in Abraham's time, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. 
Point number one, comparison. Now, many of you know that Isaac lived under the shadow of his great father, Abraham. But Isaac also lived under the shadow of his great son, Jacob. Fourteen chapters of the book of Genesis are dedicated to Abraham. Twelve chapters of the book of Genesis are dedicated to his son, Jacob. Isaac somehow finds himself in between with hardly four chapters that mention his name. And each time that Isaac is mentioned or is featured in the few chapters of the book of Genesis, he is featured as a supporting character to whoever else is being featured. In fact, Jacob, Isaac's son, is mentioned in the previous chapter, chapter 25, okay? And Moses, who wrote, you know, the book of Genesis, interrupts the story of Jacob, who was, you know, he was born and is mentioned in chapter 25 of Genesis. He interrupts the story of Jacob and now tells us about this forgotten patriarch, Isaac, in chapter 26. And we only see Isaac featuring again in chapter 27. These are the only two chapters that we see him prominently featuring. And yet he's an amazing patriarch. The point I'm trying to make is Isaac looks like the patriarch who lived behind the shadows. There are many similarities between Isaac and his father, Abraham. There are many parallels between Isaac and his father, Abraham. Both of them received God's promise and both of them received God's blessings. Both of them had very beautiful wives. In fact, there's a very interesting instance where both of them had to lie that their wives were actually their sisters so that they cannot be killed by the same king, King Abimelech. It's very interesting, the similarities between the two. Both of them prospered in the land that God had given them. Both of them built altars to the Lord. And we can go on and mention so many parallels between the two, but the parallel of interest to me, specifically in this passage today, is both of them, and the passage that we're reading begins with this parallel, both of them experienced a famine. In fact, in that first verse, it compares the famine that Isaac is in with the same famine or a famine that Abraham had also experienced. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous one. There was one in Abraham's time. And in this particular famine, the Bible says, The Lord appeared to Isaac and said to him, Do not go down to Egypt. The same God who prompted Isaac's son, Jacob, and gave him the strength and encouraged him and told him, go ahead to Egypt. When Jacob was facing a famine, God encouraged him and strengthened him to go to Egypt where Jacob's son, Joseph, was the prince of Egypt and told them, go with your family and go and seek refuge in Egypt. Many of you know the story of Joseph and how the children of Israel stayed there for 400 years. The same God who prompted Isaac's son, Jacob, to go to Egypt. The same God who spoke to Isaac's father, Abraham, when he was being rescued from the famine with his family to go to Egypt is the same God who is now telling Isaac, do not go to Egypt. Canaan was dependent on rainfall, the land where they were. But Egypt was different. Egypt could withstand a famine. Egypt could live through a drought because Egypt did not depend on rainfall. To grow their food or to water their livestock, Egypt depended on irrigation from the Nile River. That's why neighboring communities would all gravitate towards Egypt whenever there was famine in the land. 
because they were sure that you would get food in Egypt. Egypt was the logical place to go during a famine. Jacob went, Abraham went, but Isaac was told not to go. In Egypt, you are certain to find food. In Egypt, you are certain to find water. There was always the temptation to go to Egypt. And Isaac must have considered going to Egypt because it was a sure bet his family would be safe. They would find food and water. But the Lord appeared to Abraham in the begin to Isaac in the beginning of this chapter and tells him, Stay in Canaan. The leading and the guidance of the Lord is distinctive from one person to the other. This is the very first time that God speaks to Isaac directly. It's the very first time God speaks to him. The very first time God spoke to his father, Abraham, in chapter 12 of Genesis God tells Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. The very first time God speaks to Isaac, God tells Isaac what? Stay in the land that you are. Stay. We see the contrast between the instruction God gave a father and the instruction that God gives the son. And Isaac, what surprises me, unquestioningly, Isaac follows God's guidance. And Isaac settles in Gerar, this foreign region where he's in. Isaac obeyed God's voice. And because Isaac obeyed God's voice without comparing what his father had done or later on what his son does, Isaac obeys God's voice and it is because of that that he receives immense favor and immense blessings. Isaac obeyed God's voice to stay in the desert, to stay in the wilderness, to stay in his place of hardship and difficulty. Isaac obeyed God's voice to remain and to flourish where he was. And it is that that resulted in great blessings in his life. What drove Isaac's life was not what other people did or did not do. So in your desert, I want to encourage you, wait for your word. What has God told you where you are? Bind your heart to obey what God is asking you to do, however unpleasant however difficult, however challenging the place that God has called you to be is. Don't compare yourself to others. Has God called you to stay in Kenya? Jaza Pengo. Don't pick a flight and go away. This is your place of flourishing. Has God called you to stay in your marriage? Stay. Don't look for the place that other people are saying you will be able to flourish. Has God called you to stay in your job? Has God called you to stay in your neighborhood? Where has God told you to stay? That's the place where you're going to flourish. So the first thing that you need to take care of when you're in your desert, is comparison. There are many tempting things that will come your way. But many times, running after those tempting things denies you God's ultimate blessings in your life. So the first one is comparison. The second one is contempt that I see in this passage. From verse 14 all the way to verse 18. But let me start with these uh, two verses, 13 and 14. The man became rich. And his wealth continues, this is Isaac, eh? and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. The Philistines envied him. 
he was prospering while they were struggling. They were struggling through a drought, through a famine, and yet there is this man that has come and is uniquely prospering. Contempt is disregard for something that you should actually consider. Disregard. I mean, Isaac would have taught the Philistines why he is flourishing, but they disregarded him. They disrespected him. In fact, they envied him. And as Isaac became so wealthy, he also became too powerful for the Philistines. And the Philistines became jealous, and the Philistines made his life hard. They frustrated him. Every well he dug, they plugged. And they tried to frustrate every effort that he made in the land. They did not want the wells for themselves, but they did not want the well even for him. At the end of the day, all they were trying to do is to frustrate him. Now, in those days, if you dug a well, then the land that you have dug the well in was considered to be your land. In other words, a well was a statement of ownership in those days. To fill in somebody's well after they had dug it, to plug somebody's well was an act of war. And that's what the Philistines were doing. They were declaring war against Isaac. They wanted to drive him away. And they wanted, him to de they wanted to deny him what was ultimately his. The reason why I'm saying contempt in this regard and the application for us is this. When the world turns against you, when the world turns against you for your industry, for your integrity, for your unexplained success, for your unexplained favor. When the world that we're living in turns against you for your creativity, when the world turns against you for your productivity, for your talents, for your gifts, for your abilities, will you give in? Will you give up? If in this world, you live for God, I'd like to guarantee you that you will immediately become an object of ridicule. You will immediately become a target for persecution. Be it in the corporate space, regardless what space that you're in, the world is counter God. And as long as we're living in this world, anything that is pro-God will come under attack. God's prosperity sometimes will result in envy. It will result in suspicion. It will even result in resentment. Some people will try and do their very best to rob you of God's blessings. Many people will try and seem to plug up your wells. They will try and seek to plug up your wells. They will attempt to plug up your wells with discouragement, to plug up your wells with intimidation, to plug up your wells with personal attacks. The point that I'm trying to make here is do not be surprised. When the world turns against you, because God has turned his face towards you. When God turns his face towards you in favor, when God turns his face towards you and gives you prosperity that is a product of his grace, many times do not be surprised when the world also does what? Turns against you. That's exactly what Isaac experienced. The last thing is conflict. Conflict. From verse 19 all the way to verse 22, let me just select one verse in verse 20. But the herders of Gerar, the Philistines that were there, quarreled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. They claimed the water that Isaac had brought forth from the wells that he had dug. The wells that Isaac redug, the Philistines filled. 
And he continued to dig new wells. And the new wells that now he had dug, the Philistine herders now claimed that that water is theirs. When they saw the waters in their land flowing again, they contended and said, this water belongs to them. Isaac had named the wells by the same names that his father Abraham had given a long time ago. But it's interesting to see the names or the meanings of these names. The meanings of these names indicate the drama that these guys went through with the Philistines. It indicates the conflict that they experienced with the Philistines. Look at the names. In verse 20, there's a name written Esek. Esek means quarrel or contention. In verse 21, the, the well they dug, they called it Sitna. Sitna means enemy or hostility. The names of the wells reflect the challenges that Abraham and Isaac faced as they drilled these wells and continued uh, in the land. But rather than continue to fight over water, Isaac made a conscious decision to move on. Isaac made a conscious decision to keep the peace. Isaac let them have the disputed wells. He had allowed the Philistines to have all the wells that he had dug that they were claiming for themselves. Isaac stepped back. Even the new wells that he had dug, he allowed them to have. Isaac stepped back and said he's going to look for another location where he's going to drill wells that are not being contended for. Eventually, Isaac finds this place that he called a spacious place where there was room in verse 22, he gives this well the name that is reflective of this new location that he has found. He called it Rehoboth. Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. Isaac, instead of fretting, Isaac, instead of creating further disputes, peacefully and wisely moved away. He moved away from unnecessary battles because he knew that in this life and to flourish in your desert, you need to choose your battles wisely. He decided to look for his Rehoboth. He decided to look for his spacious place. He decided to look for his place of favor before God. And in finding his Rehoboth, the Philistines finally left him alone. I'd like to encourage someone here. Regardless who is trying to block your progress today, regardless who's trying to block your progress in your job or in your career, regardless who is trying to sabotage and block your progress in business, like maybe you have this business idea or concept and someone has stolen it and he's run away with it like the Philistines did with Isaac's wells. Regardless, be it somebody within the family that is sabotaging your progress and your development. Maybe it's in academia and somebody is sabotaging your academic progress. Maybe it is a supervisor who has sabotaged a project or a thesis that you're trying to do. Regardless who it is, that is trying to block your progress, I'm here to declare to you, God will bring you to your Rehoboth. God will bring you to your spacious place. Do not be upset. Do not fight back. We serve a God who is not limited to opportunities. We serve a God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly far beyond what you can think or ask and even imagine. In fact, the phrase I want to give you is advance through your adversity. Do not stop. Move on. Let go of what needs to be. Let go of. Release what needs to be. Release and step into the space that God already has ahead of you as you continue to advance with the favor and the blessings and the prosperity that God has set apart for you and nobody can take. As I close in verse 12, I want you to notice verse 12. It's an amazing verse. Isaac planted crops in that land. Not the next year, 
not the next five years, the same year, he reaped a hundredfold because the Lord, because he was a good farmer, right? Because he had amazing gifts and talents and abilities, right? Because that was perfect soil, the right pH. Because he had four tractors. That's why, right? No. Why? The Lord blessed him. That's something that no man or woman can take away from you. The Lord blessed him. Isaac sowed in famine. Isaac sowed when it didn't make sense to sow. You never sow in famine. Never. He sowed in famine, not during the time that the land was ready for seed. And Isaac reaped the hugest, most miraculous, most ridiculous harvest ever. A hundredfold. Now, some of us, when you hear hundredfold, it sounds Hebrew, Greek, it's out there. Now, let me allow the, those here in the, in, in the business space, in the commerce space to understand. This is 10 thousand percent return on investment. Just picture that. When you hear a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, by the way, that does not even begin to get to where Isaac had reached. It's not because he was a better farmer. It's because he knew God. It's because he obeyed God. It's because he avoided unnecessary battles and avoided unnecessary distractions. It's because he worked hard in obedience to God in the place that God had planted him. However difficult, however harsh the terrain, but God, when we honor him, what does the Bible say in 1 Samuel? Those that honor me, I will honor. And the Lord translated all this into blessings in his life. While others were struggling in defeat around him, we see a man flourishing in his wilderness experience because he trusted God. Not himself. <laughs> Not even his circumstances. He trusted in his God and he prospered. In fact, another just, you know, final verse in verse 25. The Bible says, Isaac built an altar there and he called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there he dug a well. Can you see those three phrases I've tried to highlight there? Can you see the first one? He built, he did three things. He built an altar. These are application things now as we close. He built an altar, he pitched a tent, and he dug a well. Can we say that together? He built an altar, he pitched a tent, and he dug a well. That's why he prospered. Instead of escaping his desert, instead of running away from his desert to seek refuge where everybody else seeks refuge, where it makes human sense to seek refuge in Egypt, he chose to obey God. When God told him to stay in his wilderness, he obeyed God. And what did he do? He built an altar. Building an altar simply means he put God first. He chose that the space he's in is a space of worship. The second thing he did is he pitched a tent. He's stuck there. Whenever you pitch a tent, it's an intention to remain, to stay. You're not going anywhere. He said, I'm staying in my situation. And finally, he dug a well. The point here is he did what needs to be done to survive in the desert. He did what needs to be done in that circumstance and that situation. And I'm saying this because there probably is someone here who is in the desert of their marriage. You're in the desert of your marriage. And I want to tell you today, build an altar. Put God first. I want to tell you today, stick in there. Make a decision that you're not going to throw in the towel. No, I'm going to stick in there. And then third, make a decision to do what needs to be done. If it's to seek counsel, seek counsel. If it's to be able to reconcile, reconcile. Do what or do what needs to be done. If it's your business, build an altar. Make a decision today that I'm going to make this my place of worship. 
I'm going to stick in this business. God called me here and I'm not abandoning this, however difficult and challenging this time is. And then dig a well. Do what needs to get done. If it's to cut back on some areas, if it's to re-strategize, do what needs to be done again in faith that God is going to allow you to prosper in your desert. God has new wells for us to dig. But God has old wells that he wants us to re-dig. Redigging old wells symbolizes clog unclogging of our hearts. Redigging old wells symbolizes that our hearts sometimes need to be unclogged because our hearts get stuffed up. Our hearts get filled up. Our hearts get covered up by the dirt of sin or by the dirt of distractions or by the... Uh, the, 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 the many times it gets uh, filled up by the dirt of misplaced priorities. It gets filled up by the dirt of discouragement or by the dirt of doubt or by the dirt of unbelief. I don't know what dirt it is that has filled an old well. But God is telling you, do not abandon that well. Take up your shovel like Isaac and go and dig it up. Let that well that seemed dead become a source of life again. Let that well that seemed dead result in flowing water. The last thing I'll say about Isaac's life is Isaac, remember how I began? Isaac began his life as the mediocre son of a great father, Abraham. He began his life as the mediocre father of a great son, Jacob. But Isaac ended his life being mentioned in equal measure with Abraham and Jacob. How many times do you read in the Bible? I can't count them. Where the Bible says, And God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob in equal measure. Simply because he flourished in his desert. God's providence will guide you through adversity. He will guide you through your desert because sometimes God allows both abundance and adversity to come in our lives. But my prayer today is that you and I will become like Isaac. You will live a life of produce. A life of productivity because you made a decision to flourish in your desert. You made a decision to build an altar. You made a decision to pitch a tent. And you made a decision to dig a well and let God prosper you a hundredfold. In Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we pray? I don't know what you're battling with today in your desert. I don't know if it's comparison. And you're battling comparison at this time. You've compared yourself to your siblings. You've compared yourself to your colleagues. You've compared yourselves to others. Other businesses, other organizations. Maybe classmates that you were with earlier on in school. And you've allowed that comparison to shatter you. To distract you. Unfortunately, even to destroy you. But today you're coming before God and you're saying, God, you created me uniquely. And I'm going to live up to your purposes for my life. I'm not going to allow comparison to destroy my opportunity in my desert. Maybe it's contempt. You've come under such a ridicule for standing up for God in the corporate space or in your family. And you've allowed that to shatter the opportunity that God has given you to continue standing for him. You're giving in. You're giving in not knowing how God honors the people that stand up for him. Maybe even you've given in and you've decided to fight the, the battles the same way. You're fighting the people that are fighting you back. And today, like Isaac, God is telling you, just step aside and step into your unique Rehoboth, your spacious place. Stop fighting over small space that is not even yours. They can never rob God's blessings from you. They can never rob God's opportunities for you. They can't. Step into your unique space. 
And let your Rehoboth, that spacious place, be your place of blessing. Maybe it's conflict. And you've allowed conflict to distract you from building an altar, from pitching a tent, and from digging your well. What do you need to do in your marriage? What do you need to do in your business? In your job, in your career? What do you need to do? Build an altar, pitch a tent, and dig a well. If you're making any of these commitments, I just want you to stand wherever you are at the close of this series on Isaac. Just stand up where you are. If you're making any of these commitments, if you're saying, I have old wells that are, that are filled, I need to empty them. I need to unclog some things in my life today. Just stand up where you are only if you're making a commitment and make that commitment to God in prayer. Make that commitment to God in prayer. If there are new wells that God wants you to dig, make that commitment in prayer and say, God, I'm going to dig this new well. I'm going to do what needs to get done because you're a God that is committed, committed to blessing me in line with your purposes and your plan. Father, you see everyone that is standing that is making a specific commitment today in response to your word. I pray that these commitments will reach your heart and that these commitments, more importantly, will move your hand. I want to release your hand of great prosperity over your people as they live in obedience, as they honor you. I stand on your word in 1 Samuel that these men and women will be honored by God because you, they have honored you. Father, we release, we release your hand to move in their lives and their respective situations. And I pray that the same covenant that you made with Isaac will be the same covenant you make with us. That, Father, we will truly experience that 100-fold blessing, that ridiculous, miraculous blessing in our lives because we were willing to honor you against all odds. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And I pray that you'll allow each and every one of us to flourish in our deserts for the sake of and for the glory of your name. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like the rest of us to stand. I'm uh, going to close for us with our benediction. It's going to be from Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Shall we together receive these benediction blessings at the end of this series? So do not fear. For God has redeemed you. God has summoned you by name, and you are his. When you pass through the waters, God will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, I declare that they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, I declare that you will not be burnt. For the Lord is your God. He gave Egypt for your ransom. Since you are precious and you're honored in his sight and because he loves you, he will give men in exchange of you, nations in exchange for your life. So do not be afraid because God is with you. Everyone who is called by his name, created for his glory and formed in his image, Finally, in verse 18. So forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See the new thing that God is doing in your life. Allow it to spring up. Let God make a way for you in the wilderness. And may God make streams for you in the wasteland both now and forevermore. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Go and flourish in your desert. Amen. God bless you.